Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure for me welcoming here Her Excellency, Madame Anna Azari, the Ambassador of the State of Israel in the Czech Republic. Welcome, Excellency. <laughs> as well as the Vice Rector of the Charles University, Her, Madame Professor Marketa Křížová. Welcome. <laughs> and of course, all of you, our dear audience, it's a real pleasure having you here at our third Café Collaborations. This event is based on a close cooperation of embassies and you, our dear visitors. Today, it's the Embassy of the State of Israel. The, in, in the intention of our, um, of our Café Collaboration is very clear. We want to enable exchange of ex um, experience, ideas, knowledge, information, and today we have a special, special opportunity to discover what secret is behind the scenes of successful Israeli startups. We will have our three distinguished speakers, Madame Ravid Avidor, Mr. Yuval Ben Isaac, and Mr. Orivais. Our dear distinguished speakers, welcome. And I wish you don't hesitate to ask any questions, our dear visitors, and of course, I wish we all enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to see this room full of people. Uh, I'm very excited to see a nice feminine presence, uh, but I will not be fully satisfied until it will be 50-50, or actually 51-49, like in the <laughs> population. The event today, behind the scene of the Israeli uh, startups, we have three Israelis here. I'm Ravit. This is Ori and Yuval, and uh, we all been living in the Czech Republic for a long time. We all Israeli originally. I'm, by the way, a Czech citizen already, and um, my lawyer, the one that helped me to do it, is sitting over there. <laughs> it's been a long journey, guys. Dobry od poledne. Um, and I think what we want to do today is to talk a little bit about the similarities and differences between Israel and the Czech Republic and see what we can learn from each other. Uh, we also have Slido. So you can go to Slido, Slido.do or Slido.com and then you put the code. By the way, the code was uh, only four digit before and now it's very long. It means that the company is successful, which is good. Uh, and ask questions. So please don't hesitate, put your question. You can do it anonymously so uh, we won't know who you are and we still address your concerns. Uh, before I start, uh, can you tell me how many of you are working for a startup? How many of you started a startup? How many of you looking to start a startup? <laughs> okay, no, that's good, that's good. So I'm a, I'm a... How many of you have had an unsuccessful startup? That's a, by the way, all of you get my appreciation for trying, so that's definitely the thing. Can you hear me if I'm not, oh, okay, I don't have to press this thing, okay. So uh, I think uh, the first question I will have to the, to the panel is uh, to present yourselves. Okay, uh, so my name is Yuval Ben Itzchak. As Ravit uh, mentioned, I'm an Israeli. I was born and uh, spent most of my life in Israel, but the last 12 years I'm here in the Czech Republic. Uh, like many Israelis, I served the Israeli army. I was one of those intelligence units that everyone's talk about doing technology. Uh, I'm an engineer in my education, uh, doing software most of my career. Uh, started my first startup in 1999, just a minute before everything exploded, almost like today. And uh, this was in cybersecurity, uh, Israel known for cybersecurity. I was part of this industry for over 20 years. Um, and that startup was sold in 2004. Following that, I was in additional startup and additional startup. That's a current tradition in Israel. Until in 2009, I received a call from a Czech company called AVG, the antivirus that you're probably all using. Um, and they asked me to join because they were looking for someone to help on the technology side. And that's what made us to move to Brno. Uh, and I was living two years in Brno, and we really love it. 
Uh, I was running the technology uh, group in AVG until we went to uh, IPO in the New York Stock Exchange, becoming the first tech company going IPO in the New York Stock Exchange. Then uh, I left there in 2015, been in other few uh, startups. And my last company, I was the CEO of Social Bakers, which I assume most of you heard the name, doing uh, software and marketing tech. Uh, and this business was acquired in the middle of COVID. Uh, and then I spent a year just handing over the business. And since the beginning of this year, I'm doing my sabbatical. So I'm enjoying the time. <laughs> and uh, now that's why I can join here. Uh, I have time. I'm Ori, uh, Ori Weiss, also an Israeli. Been here for 12 years as well. Um, spent most of my life in Israel with a couple of, uh, couple of years in the US in the middle. Um, I actually ended up here for the reason that I think about 99% of people that move to this country move here, which is sitting right there. She's laughing. Um, as opposed to Ovid, I'm not a Czech citizen yet, but I own a chalupa, so I think that qualifies me for, <laughs> for an honorary citizen, I would, I would argue. Um, I've been in the online marketing sector and SaaS sector for about 20 years. I founded a company uh, in 2003. Also not with uh, army security background, I was carrying mortar shells around, which doesn't really help you in the tech world, but improves your back muscles. <laughs> so I started a company called Excel Media in 2003. Excel Media started from, I say a basement, but it was actually my second floor apartment my parents owned, uh, so it doesn't really count as a basement, but it became quite quickly one of the largest performance marketing companies in the gaming sector, which is a fancy way to say online gambling, um, predominantly in the UK, uh, continental Europe, and Scandinavia. Um, we grew from one person in the beginning to about 450 people uh, somewhere around 2018. We listed it on the stock. We sold a majority share. To, I say we because there were two co-founders to join later on. Uh, we sold a majority share of it to a private equity group in 2012. I stayed as CEO. We listed it in 2014 on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, after that, I spent five long years as the CEO of a public company, which has a lot to do with this gray hair situation going on up here. <laughs> Plus, it forced me to buy a suit, which was frustrating. And then 2019, I decided after 16 years of doing the same thing, uh, it's time to move on. So I'm still involved. I'm still a shareholder. I'm still on the board, but not in an executive capacity anymore. Uh, since about 2010, I've been investing in a variety of different companies. So currently, portfolio is about 20, um, about five of them here in the Czech Republic, including one that's become quite popular, which is a company called Muse. I don't know if anyone knows it, uh, hospitality tech. So first investor back in 2013 when there were literally three guys in the basement. Uh, fun, fun story, I was about to say no, but again, that lady over there told me to say yes, so. Can you raise your hand, the lady over there? <laughs> <laughs> That's the lady. Ca camera shy. Um, yeah, so I invested in a variety of companies in the health, in healthcare, SaaS, gaming, price comparison. Founded another company, which I'm very happy that three of our team are here today, uh, that does performance marketing for the higher ed world, predominantly in the US, so helping, helping universities with their recruitment, helping students make the best possible decision about their career or degree choices. Uh, it's going to take some time. We're getting there. Uh, now we're here. Yeah. And then I met Ori in a driving lesson uh, and, uh, school. And, and, and because the Israelis need to pass a driving test in this country, we met. During that test, we both passed, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then uh, my fund, I'm a, I'm a founding partner at Lighthouse Venture, early stage venture capital. I invested, uh, my fund invested in Ori, so that's another connection here. Um, I've been in the Israeli ITIC since 2000. I started in a law firm called Nashitz Brandes. Uh, I'm a lawyer also, unfortunately, I have to admit that. And then uh, we went, uh, I went to Checkpoint Software, which was considered the flagship of the Israeli legacy startups, uh, the legacy generation uh, flagship. I worked there for six years. Then I came over uh, to the Czech Republic. I did m and I joined AVG as well. I've done m and mergers and acquisition for about 10 years. I acquired the companies in North and uh, Latin America, in uh, Europe, in Middle East. And uh, then in uh, 2019, I started Lighthouse Ventures. That's what bring me and keep me here today. Uh, so after we introduce ourselves, I think we can dive into the uh, real questions. Uh, the first question I have, uh, I mean, when when I moved to the Czech Republic in the past 10 years in the Czech Republic, I felt like in a way traveling back in time, going into my own DeLorean and uh, traveling back in time to the early 2000s in uh, Israel in a, good, in a good manner because we know uh, how good it turned out to Israel. But I see a lot of similarities of 
what happening here today to what happened in Israel in the early 2000s. And um, my question to you, whether you agree, you have a similar feeling, and do we really see the beginning of a startup nation here in the Czech Republic as well? Completely agree. And I can say this from personal experience, um, and I can I think one specific company would be an interesting case story for this. So Muse, again, Czech company founded here by two founders. One is Czech, one is Dutch. Um, they, their journey of trying to raise money circa two, 2012, 13, 14 from the Czech uh, VC scene, you can write an, a dramatic horror novel about that. And um, we really saw at the time that there's no interest, expertise, or kind of, nobody was asking us the right questions. Nobody was particularly interested in tech as a whole, right? There were these couple of flagships. There was AVG, and then there was a couple of others as well. But nobody was really interested in tech. Nobody was really interested in disturb and kind of disruptive technology. And um, we ended up having to go to another country to raise money. And, and we, we talked about this morning and, and flipping this company to become Dutch, when in fact it is a Czech company, and it always has been. We have 300, currently, we have more than 200 developers here. And we, I've seen over the last 10 years, this is the negative side, the positive side, that now, if you, if you kind of fast forward in your DeLorean 10 years forward, you'll see that the VC scene has evolved. Yeah. It's light years ahead. There's, there's talent. There's real analysis. There is invest, there, there's interesting companies that are being funded. And also throughout this kind of decade, I think I, I personally got very frustrated with seeing and, and seeing that the amount of talent in this country is unbelievable. There's so many smart people in doing interesting things, and most of them would get usually stuck at this very early pre-seed seed level, dealing with kind of angels they probably shouldn't be dealing with or early stage VCs that didn't even exist. So uh, yeah, I agree. It's been it's been a journey, but it, it looks very different now. Um, yeah, I totally agree as well. I remember myself in uh, the late 90s in Israel. Uh, I'm seeing here very similar um, uh, environment. First, great talent coming out of universities. I, I hired a lot of people from Charles University and, and from other universities. Very smart people, very capable. I mean, in, in the world scale, they are very capable and very smart, and they can build really great things with great ideas, and they are doing that. Uh, however, they are facing very similar challenges that we had back then, and that was uh, lack of knowledge in business, uh, challenging in marketing, being in an isolated market, and also the uh, VC environment is very challenging. There's very few an angels coming in, no big uh, venture capital coming in, and that makes it very hard to raise money and basically someone to sponsor the risk that you take in as a founder. However, in the last uh, few years, I started to see more and more people trying, more and more people uh, opening and starting a startup, give it a try, failing and starting again. So they're not shy of failure and they want to try again. We're starting to see them learning from bigger companies or from uh, executives that being hired, including myself being hired from the outside and leveraging this experience for the next startup. And this is exactly the same stage that we've seen in Israel about 20 years ago. And I think with more support from the country to enable risk and uh, um, I would say both from the investment side but also from the talent side, I think we will continue to see those young entrepreneurs being successful and we're starting to see here the first step of exits, very similar. I don't know how many of you used ICQ back in the days, right? That was, yeah, the, those that are used to be young, right? It's in close uh, your age, guys. Be careful. Uh, that was a big exit at my time. Just as I finished my university, uh, ICQ was acquired for $400 million, and I actually knew the founders. I was with them in, this, in, the, in the same room when they designed ICQ, and suddenly they become so rich that I was so jealous, and I said, I must try it myself. So it's a lot of inspiration, a lot of, uh, I would say, push, and that's exactly what happened right now. This, you're starting to see more exit coming, and exit from, from young entrepreneurs, not from big companies. And that, again, that's fueled the market, that's give those young uh, engineers and uh, entrepreneurs more reason to try it, and I think it will take a bit more time, but we'll see very similar synergy. Well, that I'll add a follow-up question to those who raised their hand. Do you remember your ICQ number? That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Now, a, a different comment to that. Look, I, Probably I, early adapters with a small number. Right? <laughs>
an important thing that's going on, and, and I think it's becoming more and more obvious that, uh, to me at least, this is my subjective opinion on this, I feel that in some sense the Czech Republic, um, in terms of where it is in the evolution of the startup scene, is better positioned than Israel was back then. Because Israel, like it or not, we're not surrounded by company, countries we can really trade with, although that's changing now. And the U.S., Israeli companies were kind of forced to try to scale up traditionally into the U.S., which posed a lot of challenges and usually ended up with them being acquiring, acquired way You're too soon. You're taking too many questions I have to oh, follow. Yeah, I'm not, okay, I'm not, so I, wait, I promise. Wait with this. Okay. It's a great transition to the next question. Yeah, and moving on. We will do it. It's a good segue, but uh, just uh, to give some statistics, like from our fund, uh, we're reviewing uh, over 100 uh, startups every month. This is crazy number. Uh, given the size of this market, 100, uh, 100 startups. I think we're also seeing uh, what we haven't seen before. The big bang of Israel was the ICQ, as you said. I think we already had the big bang here because we already have a few unicorns, a product board, social bakers. Uh, we, see start, we see investment rounds of hundreds, uh, of tens of, uh, of millions of dollars in valuation of hundreds, Muse, uh, for example. So I definitely think... Uh, we are in the path, I don't know it's if... It's coming, to, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. So it's definitely very similar to what we see. But uh, another similarity is that I see, like uh, one similarity is that you, also, you mentioned in your uh, answer, is that uh, we, we're dealing with two small markets, like uh, the population in Israel and the Czech Republic is, is quite similar, it's about 10 million people, plus minus. I think uh, in Czech Republic a little more, in Israel a little less. But this is the zip code. And um, it means that the local market is just, it's, it's not big enough to, for growth. So at a certain point, a company that want to be successful and really grow significantly, they need to have, they need to go global. The question for you is, uh, when do you think is the right time to go global? Yeah, going global, it's uh, always a question of every uh, leader of every business. And uh, when you say going global, it's not that you become Microsoft and have an office all around the world, which some startup actually did that mistake and burned all their money and had to close down. But um, I think once you start to get the good market product fit and you start to get traction and you understand where is your market and who is the potential buyer, that's probably a good time to start and expand in that region. Uh, probably hire local people in that region uh, to help you because they know that region better than you do. But uh, that's probably the time. Trying it, trying doing that too early, probably going to be too costly and you're going to spend a lot of time because there's no market fit, there's no good traction. Uh, doing it too late, you may lose a market that your competitor or your potential competitors will step in and take it from you. So it's always tricky. There's no like exact point when to do that, but there is um, kind of an area or, or, or a range where it's you better do that before it's too late. Yeah, without being too granular, obviously there's very big differences between a B2B platform and a B2C, right? With B2C, your, your consumers, Correct. at the end of the day, if you're localized, you can offer them the product. Of course, you need to customize it. B2B is very different because it's usually more complex sales. And, and I agree, Once you need to nail product market fit in your home region, um, mainly, not mainly, but also because realistically, if you're thinking of scale-up money, more, most investors would want to see at least you winning in your home ground before they back you to go in somewhere else. So that's definitely something you want to show at least, you know, functional unit economics, uh, sustainable growth, you, you want to see that. Another thing I would say, and this is even for B2B, and again, I, I use the Muse example because it's close, it's here, right? They started selling here, running around. I remember the founder, dry, hey, I just came back from Calo Vivari, I'm going to Spindle of I'm driving, it. okay. And they, na they nailed all the hotels here, and then they started scaling up elsewhere with the lessons learned. But I would argue that, and we talked about it again this morning, I would argue that in some instances, you c I would do even kind of pilot testing abroad to see if the product really fits. Because again, uh, for example, in hospitality tech, uh, if we, we wanted to get into France, France is now one of Muse's biggest, biggest markets, there was a one and a half year process that we had to go through and we only found out when we tried to sell to French customers. Um, it's some certification process. And obviously that's relevant for complicated tech and I, I would imagine it could be relevant for B2C as well if, if, if it's, let's say, financial products or something like that. So I would argue that it's worth at least to start the conversation with whatever region you want, to see, you want to grow into before you actually do it and before you actually go hire the people. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you that beta and launch uh, of the product should be in the local market. Uh, it's just easier. It's just easier to speak to people you know and sell them the solution. But one thing that is important to say, even if you 
if you work, you start locally, you always need to think globally from day one. When you establish the company, when you choose the name for the company, when you build your go-to-market strategy, when you build your prototype solution, uh, you have to think about what is my target audience in the long run. And also internally, the culture needs to be global. You have to have all the documentation in English. And that's something we insist on in our fund. All the documentation is done in English, not because we don't like Czech or we don't like Hebrew, because it's just not relevant languages for business. So English should be the, the language, the business language of the organization. It means that all documentation, all corporate communication must be done in English. And, it, and I think this is very important, even if you start uh, locally and then go globally. Um, a question maybe to myself, but you can try to answer as well. Uh, when do you think, uh, what, what, at what stage would you suggest startup to seek foreign funding? Because that's part of it. You're the VC. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you have, Yuval, you want to take it? I'll ask you the question. At what stage should I look for funding? <laughs> okay, okay, since you insist, I will answer. So, not surprisingly, I think that the first, uh, the first, the initial funding, the seed funding, I would, re I would recommend to take from a local fund because, first of all, it's easier. You need to gain trust. You don't have the solution. You don't have the product yet. You basically... You need to get money based on the promise, and it's much easier to do it when you're talking to someone that knows that you share the same culture. The other thing is that a local investor would understand your challenges. If you go to a, an American investor, for example, for your, for, for your initial, uh, for your seed round, they not necessarily understand what it means uh, a small market, because in the US you can sell for the local market for years, maybe forever, and you've still been growing the company. But if you're coming to a Czech investor, this, this investor understands that there is a challenge that needs to be overcome, and they can support you. Uh, of course, in the next round, now that you want to go global, you better find a foreign investor from your target market. So if you want to go to Germany, try to find investors in Germany because they will, have, they will be able to, they have a network there, they will be able to introduce you to gap the cultural gap for you, uh, to introduce you to relevant parties. So I think this is the path uh, to go. Yeah, no, I, I would say definitely, um, look, realistically speaking, uh, you're a startup, uh, you, you have a PDF, an idea, and a couple of developers building something for you. You can't be too picky. Let's, let's be realistic here. Uh, and, and it's most likely going to be angels, or these days there's all kinds of incubators and stuff like that that will write the first micro check for you and give you an office, and you can scale it up from there. Um, but ideally, and this is something that, again, is very much an ideal, you want, you will always, and I'm saying this is obvious, you want smart money. You don't want just random money from, from whoever's, if you, can, if you can get it, wait for the smart money, because you need those connections. And, and, and this is relevant for every round, right? So seed a good angel or collective of angel investors with topical knowledge would be great credentials for your first VC round. Round A, a great VC with sector-specific experience will be a great intro to round B investors that want, to, oh, that, they, they know everything about hospitality tech or healthcare services, so I'm definitely in. So you definitely want to keep building up this kind of knowledge, internal clout, I would say. Clout is the word I would use for this. So you want to, people that, or people or funds that know about your sector have already vetted this. And this is relevant from the first earliest angel investor. Yeah. But uh, going back to what we, we've spoken before about the development of the market, I think like uh, five years ago, it was very hard to find early, um, early uh, funding, uh, funding for early stage startups. You had to go to angels. I think uh, now you can find it, not just us. There's other funds as well that are doing it. And that's another uh, a step in the development of the market. You can get smart money very, very early also from uh, smart angel investors, but also from funds, which was, not an was almost not an option before. And I think that's a very good sign. Talking from the investor side, not from the founder side, I think uh, what we're seeing here, which was exactly the same in Israel, uh, investors are not seeing a lot of benefit in taking all those risks. They have many other options. Uh, one thing that over time, it didn't happen overnight, but Israel was smart enough to do is to give some benefit to angel investors, tax benefit to angel investors to take that risk. Yeah, they will see the rewards. The country, of course, going to see the reward. But when you start at early stage, when the 
risk is like in the roof. There are some benefit for angel investor to invest. And I think this is something that we're not here yet. I don't know if there's anyone here from the uh, Czech finance organization uh, to consider, but I think it's an area that the country should develop is to look on tax benefit for early stage investors in tech and give them some benefits. So then you'll start to see more flow and money into the market, encouraging those young entrepreneurs to take risk because the investor also going to see a nice rewards if that will be successful. And that will enable more of those early stage investment, uh, which are hard to find uh, comparing to other regions where those tax investments uh, are available. No, absolutely. Look, we saw this with, I think it's called EIS in the UK. So the the, insure, the kind of pension protected investment that, that gave a huge boost. Original question, when, when is the right time? And again, I'll speak from an investor's perspective and I would say, argue a spoiled investor because a spoiled investor like uh, is somebody that's not stressed to invest, right? A fund has to deploy money. Angel investors have the privilege of not having to deploy money. They do it because they want to. I think the right time is obviously, it goes without saying that you need to have a clear plan. Obviously, any investor you want on board will understand that plan will most likely change. But you need to have a clear plan. You need to have set everything in place. But most importantly, and again, this is a spoiled element here, you need to show that you've committed to it, right? And this means usually, and understood, understandably, and I'm trying to be as practical as possible, understandably, uh, most investors will get it that you haven't quit your day job yet. But that means something if you have, right? Have you invested from your own money? Ha is there friends and family money in this already before the first? Because does friends and family count as external? Not really, right? So have you committed? Now, nobody, again, nobody's expecting you to have mortgaged your house to, and, and, and then ended up with no money. But there's some level of commitment that any decent investor would want to see. And uh, for me, at least, that's, that's important. Yeah. Uh, what are the best practices and common mistakes you think when company, that companies are doing when trying to go global? When you go global, it means that you work in another country and you deal with another culture. And some people who are going global forget about it. And they believe that the way they behave in their local market is exactly the same in other markets. And it's not just about language. It's about how you do business, how do you engage with other people. And we've seen, including myself, doing the mistake when I started, uh, and you bring your own culture and your own behavior to an area where people behave differently. Uh, and one of the lessons learned is to hire someone local, definitely at the beginning when you're not yet uh, familiar with the market, bring someone local that you trust, someone that you feel have the skill that you need, but that individual knows how to do business in that region and be your face or the company face in that region, that tend to be very successful and very helpful for you to expand uh, globally. Yeah, definitely agree. No, look, it's, can, couldn't agree more. I have the, the personal experience of trying to be that Israeli uh, in the London stock market. It took some while, some time for me to adjust to, you know, even to a point where I mistakenly wore brown shoes. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> when you meet investors, they have to be black. Really? I continue to wear brown because I I'm, didn't know that, but you can wear any, because, any, any color you want when you meet Because with I decided to be a rebel, I, continue, I stuck to the brown, but uh, <laughs> no, but on a more uh, serious note, it's important to really understand, beyond, of course you need to understand the culture, but especially if you have local team members, right? In Israel, in a normal office environment, we speak very different than you would speak in an office in Czech, or you speak in an office in the UK or in the US. There's different hiring policy, there's different um, different kind of behavioral policies, right? It's not, again, you're absolutely right, it's not just, the language is just kind of the end part of it, right? Um, uh, we. <laughs> We're known for being very straightforward, and we sometimes, for example, I, I'm sticking to the example that I know, being the Israeli living abroad, is that we need to kind of tame it down a bit, right, sometimes. And we need to understand that maybe people need, can't be told exactly what you feel, exactly the time that you feel it. Um, in, their, in their face. In their face, with no prior warning. So things like that, and by the way, funnily enough, I really believe in this, I've, I, it took me a while to get there, I really believe those are the things that make or break uh, organizations when they scale, right? You see this when an M&A, so for example, a company that buys a company in another country and tries to force their kind of culture, it it's just a recipe for disaster. And I think 99, you, they always say, there was this Harvard research, I think it was Harvard or Stanford, I don't remember which one, that said that 95% of M&A ends up losing value to the shareholders of both companies. I know 67, but yeah. Okay. Who counts? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I exaggerate. Yeah. No, but I, anyway, so generally speaking, I, th I would argue that the majority of 
that lost value comes from culture clashes and not from product, uh, from not from uh, not being able to establish cost synergies. No, it's become people arguing because they don't understand each other. I agree with you. It's a hundred percent of the acquisition are successful. Sixty-seven fell in the integration phase. Uh, this is where it's happened, and that's where really the clashes, uh, the cultural clash, not just be between two different clashes, also between two different organization, organization. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, first, the first thing is really to um, um, hire locally versus relocate, and that's uh, I see it a lot. A lot of uh, the a lot many of the founders I'm talk I'm talking to here, they want to relocate to the U.S. They want to relocate to other market. It looks very. It looks very the right. The right way to go, but but really, French will be best selling to French, German will be best selling to Germans, and American will be best selling to Americans. So you should rely on local. It's harder. It's harder to rely on a culture you don't know, but you have to do it. That's one thing. And I think another uh, another mistake that uh, companies are doing when trying to go global is when they're trying to go to too many too many markets, to two markets, three markets at the same time. It's, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of attention to open a new market, so do it in stages. Going to Slovakia, for me, like Czechoslovak, it's very similar culture. Yes, you can tell me I'm going to Slovakia and Poland at the same time. I consider it as entering only one new market. But uh, trying to, okay, I want to do Benelux. You cannot do Benelux, it's too much. You cannot do it. It's three different cultures, even though it sounds like very, very similar. So it's very important and to this, do this. This uh, beckons an interesting question. Okay, I'll ask you, you've probably done this before. How do you find, if you really need to rely on local people, right, then you need that local MD. That is, will be your eyes and ears. And you, you need that person, the local country manager, that will understand your, in our case, this Israeliness that you bring, and you build, but will be able to manage, understand your product, understand your drive, understand your aspirations, and kind of translate. So, have you done this? Is this? Yeah, I remember the first interview I made for a sales manager in the US. I was very impressed by the person, and then I asked myself, why am I impressed? And I, then I found out he just speak great English, <laughs> which for us, Israelis, it's quite difficult, right, to speak great English. And I was listening to him, and I said, yeah, he speaks so well, because I'm not used to that. And he was a very bad sales, salesperson, but I was impressed by the very, very wrong reasons. Uh, but quickly realized why I hired that guy. And uh, then I had to learn and to adjust. So it's a common mistake that sometimes you're going to a different culture and there's barriers that you have and you see other person and you feel he is the right or she is the right person for that role, but for completely different reasons. So um, I did that mistake, learned from that. But uh, when you go and hire people in other places, you really need to understand and ask yourself, what are you looking on that individual and trying to take the culture and language aside, identify that. Assume that you'll make your first mistake in that region because it takes time to find the right people even in your, in your own country. So not to say in a different country, uh, but then very likely you'll learn from mistake and you'll be successful. I will quote you this morning. You said after the 37 employee, I, I understand that they don't have control of everything. So it's the same uh, experience. You said like the first employee, I know everything about him or her and it's going on. 37, I, I don't control anymore. So I guess it's it's pretty much you have to let go. You, know, so you may, may do mistakes, but it's part of the way, and it's completely legitimate. Uh, another question, uh, I spoken to uh, someone here before the meeting, and I think it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, building a unicorn or selling to a unicorn? I think, it, okay, I'm going to make a big statement. You should never build a company to sell. That's, that's all wrong. Um, and I think whoever starts a business with the intention of selling it, I'm going to build this business and sell it in three to five years. No, then don't start. Um, the best transactions that actually bring value to shareholders are the ones that were initiated by the buyer. And buyers initiate com try process to buy great companies that have done well and are not looking. You've never seen value created in a sales process. Um, and this is probably, I don't know if that's a topic for later, but something that has always frustrated me when I read all those headlines in Israeli newspapers, another company was sold for 500 million, another company was sold for 3 billion. Why didn't they wait and sell for 50? Why didn't they wait and just stay independent? I actually have an answer for that, but later. Yeah. And then you have Checkpoint, right, which has yeah. consistently stayed independent for, I don't know, 25 years. Obviously, they've had their ups and downs, and so it ties into the build for exit or not build for exit. There is also the third path of building a great company. 
And yes, maybe at some point your shareholders will push you to sell if some offer comes in. But I'm, I think, and this is, by the way, this is something that I think Israel and Czech have a similarity in. Czech is still needs some time to catch up. I'm looking for $10 billion Czech companies, $10 billion Israeli companies, not owned by some American corporation that bought them for two. That's good for the economy. That's good for, that's good for the branding of the country. And it's starting to be a trend in Israel. Was it, uh, I think Waze was sold for a billion. If they would have held on to it, they would be worth much more and still probably, maybe not, but they would probably sell for much more. And, and even Mobileye, that $15 billion deal, why not stay Israeli? You know? I think that uh, you're speaking for a very spoiled point of view. If we're looking back in Israel in the first decade, like if I'm talking from 2000 to 2010, even 2015, um, they, the path out was mostly, uh, okay, there were some IPOs, yes, of, on the Nasdaq, but a lot, many companies were sold because if you look here at the market, IPO is almost not, not an option. So at the end of the day, uh, yes, you can, uh, you can create value by becoming a unicorn in rounds, but really seeing the money in the bank is not that easy. So I wouldn't uh, take easily any offer for acquisition at any stage, definitely not in the conditions of the market today. Condition and means that IPO is not really, not really an option in the Czech Republic. Uh, but I think that over, the time, over time, the market will mature. And that's what happened in Israel. You saw more like companies being sold to foreign companies. But, you know, if you look at Israel, it wasn't that bad. At the end of the day, a lot of uh, companies that acquired centers in Israel kept the centers in Israel. So basically, you keep the employees in Israel, but you add knowledge, you add funds. That helps. It, eventually, it helps the, the, the development of the people. It's help uh, with taxes. It is a good thing. Of course, we want, you should, I agree with you, you should build a company not to sell it, but if an opportunity comes to you, Doria, I don't say, yeah. if you say no, I will be really upset. Like, that's my, that's my exit model. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a company, good companies are not built uh, to sell, they are bought. Uh, and um, you cannot create a company to sell it because if it's so great, why would you sell, right? So if you're doing it this way, probably it's not going to be a great company. But um, let's not forget young entrepreneurs seeing a lot of money in front of them. They want to sell. I remember myself, my first investor in my company, I started in 99. I think a year into the journey, he asked me, so what do you want from this company? I told him, I want to buy an apartment. I told me, what? said, yeah, I want to buy an apartment because back then that was for me the unreachable target. And if I manage to do that, I'll be super successful. He told me, okay, you got it. Then what? And I said, I don't know. I didn't plan for something bigger than that. That was the bigger thing. So let's not forget these are very young entrepreneurs that work very hard uh, getting their you know, salary, which, you know, get them their living, but suddenly this business can open for them something that is unreachable and they want to achieve that. I think as uh, for them, if an acquisition come to the table, they will probably not going to say no if it's in a good price, but you don't build the business to achieve that goal because it's never going to be a good business and you're probably not going to get your return and at the best you're going to pay your bills. Uh, so that's, that's how you build the I business. I think we agree, yeah. Build... Build not to sell, but sell if it comes. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll add to, I'll add two comments to that, and I completely agree. Look, I am spoiled, yeah. and and I am uh, kind of I'm I'm looking for I, it's a, it's a pride thing, national pride, both for Czech and for Israel, right? I would like I said, I would love to see huge Czech companies with thousands of employees, uh, you know, paying out dividends to the shareholders. But I would say that there is two trends that are interesting, or one is a trend. There's the trend of these secondary private secondary secondary focused private equities. So these are companies or funds or whatever that they specialize in just buying shares from founders so they don't have to sell the whole company. This is a great way for founders to get liquidity. I think it's an interesting trend in the market for companies to remain independent while founders being able to cash out and buy that apartment they wanted. Uh, an another thing is that, and this is something that I think will be relevant here um, soon, and Israel I think had this 10, 15 years ago, is that one Correct me if, if you think differently, but one of the reasons Israeli companies sold relatively early is because they had a hard time scaling in the U.S. They needed that U.S. buyer to, to, to sell whatever product or service they built because they couldn't get past that culture gap. And they needed the American uh, marketing team, they needed the American sales team, and they just reached some kind of glass ceiling. I hope that doesn't happen here, 
and I hope that it won't happen anymore in Israel, but that's something that if, if this country can preemptively think of, it will be good. <laughs> I want to touch on a, a topic that, um, a different topic. I want to talk about the participation of women in the tech work, workforce. I will quote a few, I give some statistics. A report that was uh, published earlier this year, I think in March, suggests that out of all, uh, it focuses on this uh, central CE region. It suggests that out of all uh, investment that were made into startups in our region, Last year, in 2021, only 1% went to startups that were founded by, by women, founding team of women only. 5% to a, a startup that were founded by mixed team of men and women, while 94% went to startups that were founded by men only. I, can see, I, I, I believe you can see it's not balanced. This is in our region. The situation in Israel is a bit better, uh, but still not equal. There is inequality, unfortunately, there's in every corner of the world. In Israel, uh, women comprise less than 35% of the high-tech workforce. And uh, the first time we saw a woman-led unicorn in Israel was in uh, March 2021. That was Papaya Global by Anad Gez. It took 21 years to come to the first unicorn. And you know, the unicorn herd in Israel is quite big. So we have Papaya Global, this was another uh, company, um, uh, I forgot the name right now. Uh, but what, what do you think about it? What, how can we do it better? Look, I'm, <laughs> I'll share a personal story on this, plus I'll start with the end. I'm a big believer in uh, equality of opportunity, not equality of result, right? Equality of, out equality of outcome. I don't think social engineering works, right? And my opinion is that if we set the playing field level and we make sure that no group, women or any other group, has a worse starting point, we've done our job. And then we, let, we need to let everyone make their choices. So, as, for example, Excel Media back in the day in Israel was called WebPals. We had 450 employees at the time. Eight, six out of eight top C-suite were women. CEO was a woman, CFO, C CTO was not. But whatever, six out of eight, we're 54, 55 percent women in the company, and we achieved that not by social engineering anything. We just hired whoever we thought was best for the job. Now I know that sounds super naive, and maybe from a bigger country perspective, some manual involvement is need, needs to be done. But I think for us, as as an ecosystem ecosystem of, of business or tech or whatever, our job is to make sure everyone has a decent starting point and then let them make up their choice, make up their mind on their own. Uh, and not, for example, I completely agree that like uh, you, you have these end cases, right? You have like, uh, how do we deal with, with pregnancies, for example, right? So we had, we had women that we didn't even hire yet. We just sent them an email that we would like to send them a contract and we, we had a case that one of them sent she's pregnant. Of course we hired her still. And that's, I just think that it's... it's You're a unicorn, really. You're in a company because I the, I the hope statistics not. shows that that's not what happened in the market. And that's, that's, we the question is, how do we create more unicorns like you? And I agree with you, by the way, that it should not be true. I mean, of course, I appreciate any regulation. Anything that can support it is good. But I think at the end of the day, uh, to make it happen, we need to create awareness. That's one thing. And the other thing I think it's really important is role modeling. So when I'm when I'm Talking about awareness, I'm talking about speaking about this in conferences like we're doing right now, uh, writing articles, bringing this topic up. And I'm bringing this topic, uh, first it's important for me, but also Her Excellency, uh, uh, the ambassador asked me to speak about it. And, and I think it's important. It is important because I think that when we speak about it, we spotlight an issue that many don't even consider to be a problem. It's important to understand that there is a problem in order to start working, yes. Okay, my name is Linda Susbartova and I represent here Czech Israeli Chamber of Commerce and also Charles University because I'm on board of commercialization. And I very much uh, support this um, diversity and promotion that I see in, in Israel. What I see is that women entrepreneurs, according to my knowledge, right now get 75% help from the state of Israel for starting their business which I think is a great help and assistance. Because I think that Israel, compared to the Czech Republic, realize the need to promote women and diversity at large, which we are missing, okay? Also people with different abilities and so on. So if you can cooperate with that, and Ori, I totally agree with you, but not every company is doing this. 
And I have talked to so many women who were frustrated, laid off, discriminated against, and so on, that it's just painful. It's like, we cannot say by fish who is swimming in the dirty water, like fish, if you keep swimming, the water will become clear. No, no, it's not up to the fish. It's up to us to provide clean water and non-discriminatory environment. Okay, and the second reason I'd like to ask is not about the state involvement, but what I see in Israel that more companies are behaving according to CSR. That very many companies do mentoring, that very many companies support underprivileged groups, being men, being women, being children from different uh, unprivileged areas and so on. And this is again a thing I, we need to learn in the Czech Republic that CSR means truly CSR and giving back. So if you could comment on this. Thank yeah, you. I, by the way, I agree with you that the government uh, can support. Uh, what I meant is that I personally don't believe that if you say, okay, half of the board needs to be women, it's the answer to it because, you know, there's a way to bypass this. I think that uh, the government will do great if they support organizations that promote women in business. Chiquitas, for example, here in the Czech Republic, these are a organization that uh, their mandate is to invest in uh, women-led businesses and when they're doing it, they don't just uh, support the specific uh, women, they actually create a role model in the market. So when you think about it, the more women we have in key roles, then these women are role models to other people. They attract other people to join the market. So the circle is already growing, but the newcomers also become role models in their time. And this is how I believe uh, it could work with the government support, to support organizations that their mandate is to be investment based on the gender based on diversity, it doesn't have to be the gender, it could be any diversity, and then creating those role models. That's the other thing uh, next to awareness. Those organizations create awareness and they create role modeling and I think this is the way to go. Of course, I, I, I give my bless to any, any uh, attempt to support it, but uh, what I think is effective is exactly that. Uh, I'd like to add a different point of view as someone who um, had the Navy G 800 employees and Social Baker 500 employees here in the Czech Republic, um, that every woman that either I hired or was in the team was better, if not equal, to the men doing a similar job. So I think uh, women need to understand and come from a position that they are uh, not less than anyone else, but also for managers and for those who hire need to understand that, yeah, your hiring process needs to be good, but a woman is as equal, if not better, than the men. And I'm saying it from experience, not just statement in the, in the sky. And that's something that the Israeli, um, I would say, industry learn over time. It's not that what was just described always was always the case. It wasn't the case 20 years ago. It was very much like here, very man, male type of dominance and women kind of doing side job. Yes, thankfully, it's not as it used to be. Of course, there's more to do. But I think this is what uh, the market here in the Czech Republic need to develop and encourage. And that doesn't start just by making statement. It starts in a very early stage. Because in a very early stage, and I'm talking from more on the engineering side, you see in the classes mainly males, and you don't see a lot of uh, females. And it's a start, and, and both with a vast NAVG, you would say competitors, but we both donated, even myself on a personal level, to initiative to encourage young kids and young uh, uh, girls to learn and be exposed to more technical roles. It does, they don't need to be just engineers, but more technical role before there is this kind of a mental split that male are doing engineering and female doing, I don't know, or just marketing or whatever, soft skill. No, this is more of uh, education in a very early stage to make them expose and, and, and teach them so then there will be uh, availability in the market because they're more male engineer than female engineer. So of course you will see more male engineers in work and less female engineer in work. So it starts in very early stage, but once they are available and qualified, they are not uh, less 
uh, in terms of quality, and I'm saying firsthand working with them. I, I agree with you, Val. It's also about public state of mind. It's not just about the employers. I mean, I take my ex my example in the fund. I told you I, uh, we're reviewing 100, uh, 100 startups a month. Even if I wanted to pick 50 startups led by women, I don't have any chance to do it because I see women-led startup once every long while. So I think it's both ways. It starts from the very early age education and understanding that, yes, we can do it. And also, on the other hand, to have the business uh, community supported from this. So it's kind of uh, from both sides. It's a chicken and egg. I see you smiling and I understand why. It's a chicken and egg. It's true. But uh, we have to, to break the circle somehow. And we have more control on the education, actually, from young, young age than on the business community. Just easier to do it there, I think. To start there. Uh, absolutely. Look, we, uh, our job as the business community is to hire the best person for the job. Uh, yeah. I think that's always our job. Yeah. And, and I really hope that, and I saw it in Israel. Look, I, I studied engineering. I'm, I would say I'm quite a poor engineer, but uh, ma made it through somehow, miraculously. <laughs> and uh, there, were quite, there were plenty of women studying as well. Um, and many of them, I assume, reached you know, top tech roles later on. Not, not, that was just my very subjective opinion, but the state definitely on the education level and supporting kind of more a more diverse uh, career path or for any any person, men, women, that, that that's that's a super positive thing. What would you pick up as the best recommendation how to accelerate the innovation ecosystem and motivation which would be transferred transferable to the Czech Republic? I think um it's, uh, it's both sides. It's both from investors and the entrepreneur. It, it's not going to happen just one side. And both of them taking big risk, and that risk needs to come with the rewards. Because for an engineer, they can go work for Škoda, and they know how much they're going to earn. They know how their retirement is going to look like, and probably Škoda is not going to disappear anytime soon. Well, in startup, it will disappear. Uh, and they will have no job, and all their friends are going to laugh at them in the bar, and, and those kind of things, right? That's, that's what... What I'm hearing when I'm asking people why you're not taking the risk. And also for the investor. The investor can think, wow, this is a super high risk business. Why should I put my money in? And in order to uh, make the magic and make the ecosystem successful, both sides need to see benefit for the very high risk they're taking as an employee or as the founder to have the tax benefit. For example, in the Czech Republic, you cannot give options or stock to non-founders. It's just given as a virtual stock, which basically it's a fully taxed income. Uh, and also for the investors, there's not a lot of benefits as they will find in other markets. So innovation exists in the country. As I said at the beginning, very smart engineer coming out of the university uh, and very, uh, I would say, interesting entrepreneurs that I'm seeing in the market. But to make it uh, happen and to really explode it, I think both sides need to see the benefit uh, as a result of the risk that they're taking. I want to stress on something you said about um, how people treat uh, entrepreneurs that failed. I think that, uh, first of all, statistically, most of the entrepreneurs will fail because that's the statistic. Uh, that's the model of the, of the high-risk investment in, in, in startups. In Israel, I think uh, people are being appreciated for being entrepreneurs, for trying and it doesn't matter what the consequences. And I think it would be nice, and I see it more happening here, that people kind of starting to appreciate people for trying, but people uh, in many cases judge for the consequence. And I think that it would be great if this state of mind will be changed and people would just be appreciated for trying, even if they ended up failing. Because, you know, the failure is part, is, is part of the way. You have to try in order to be successful. And when you try, you can also be not successful. But try to dare and take the risk. This is where we, what we should appreciate. Uh, absolutely. Look, I think this, this requires a bit of a mind, sh mind shift from the, inv from the angel investment community and the VC and anyone involved in backing. They have to understand the simple fact that the ROI on, on early stage investment is terrible. The volatility is impossibly high, and one in a hundred, or whatever—I don't know what the numbers are exactly—one in a hundred is going to get get you num get your results. And we have to look at why people fail, right? So, if somebody failed because they mismanaged the the budget or they hired poorly, that's a very different thing than if somebody failed because the, the market didn't react well or or some some regulatory change or whatever. So, I, as you say. Failure is fine. Of course, we should kind of root out the ones that failed because of negligence or whatever, but we need to support the ones that failed for reasons maybe out of their control. There is a simple equation. Success equal 
a lot of failures. You're telling that we are following the path uh, Israel had 20 years ago. Is there something that could prevent Czech Republic becoming a successful start market? To prevent, uh, I think just economic environment and uh, legislation, legislation will prevent it. Legislation environment, I think. I think if that, they will learn from Israel or from other countries where a startup ecosystem uh, becomes successful, I think there's no reason because resources, talent is here and there's no reason why Czech Republic will not be successful in that. It could be, but uh, if I have to think of something from the top of my head, really the legislation, the corporate law here is very hard for people that are not from the Czech Republic to understand. Uh, the inability to establish ESOP, all this phantom share. Uh, we sold the company uh, in March to an Italian company. It was so hard to explain why we su suppose at the time of acquisition to create shares that we're actually going to give to employees because we didn't have ESOP. Also creating a lot of a tax event for the employees because they didn't have the shares for three years. All of this is not supporting environment from task, tax perspective, corporate law. So I think this is one thing that needs uh, need, uh, to be changed. Anything that is related not to the leg really the legislation, but to the private market, I think it will happen. It will happen because the, the, the forces are there and it's moving. When selecting and supporting startups, how do you approach sustainability? Any specific metrics or priorities you work with? Any sustainability-related goals? Uh, goals? I guess this question was for me. And uh, the answer is that our main mandate is not, from, from our investor, is not necessarily to uh, invest into sustainable um, ideas. I'm a sustainability freak. I recycle everything, I reuse, of course, first reuse, they recycle, I'm, I'm totally into this, but, uh, but that's not my mandate, so this is not one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm supporting. Of course, if, if, a company, if a company is also uh, uh, doing something that is sustainable, I'm happy to do it, it's a good cause for me, but I I'm, I'm personally cannot take decision based on this because that's not the mandate I was given, but there are companies in this market that, there are funds that this is their mandate and they're choosing based on, uh, on um, the solution being sustainable. Uh, what first steps would you recommend to a Czech startup, early stage versus uh, up and running, wanting to expand to Israeli market? The question is why? <laughs> this is uh, uh, from exactly. one small market to another small market, so? I, I would ask exactly the same why. It's, it's a small market with limited kind of connection to its surrounding markets. I, I would say there's mo so many other places to try before. Expand your investors for Israel because there's a lot of investor ecosystem, but probably it's not going to be that great of idea. But yeah, that's the case. I know one Czech company that's very successful in the Israeli market, Linet. What do they do? Small beds for hospitals. Oh, hospital beds, very much specialized. Tip of the hat to them. That's impressive because it's especially the Israeli Israeli. By the way, go with, uh, going with hardware is always a good no, good way because in Israel we don't have too much. It's not the most dynamic. Uh, why should a foreign startup base their business here? Or well, maybe you should answer because you're kind of with Muse or also well, Odeon. you yeah. So I would say that um, Czech is a good uh, used to be a good middle ground between what was perceived as kind of the the outsourced locations and let's say not in source location, but it's not that anymore. I think the prices here are for, for talent are not dissimilar from any other country in Central or, East or Western Europe. But I think the reason to be here is that geographically, it's right in the middle of everything. It's tons of, tons of smart people here. The schools are just churning, are just pushing out super qualified graduates in so many different disciplines. And yet it's not as expensive as some other regions. It's not that cheap as well. Um, and people here, um, I think, although we're seeing a change now, right? Uh, you look at uh, Avast, Product Board, sorry, Product Board, Muse, these kind of companies, it's, it's starting to become a little bit more competitive for the workforce. But I would argue that there's still an opportunity here. There is an Israeli company, actually public company, Essential One from cybersecurity that um, opened their offices over here recently and actually committed for a billion crown investment next three years. Uh, let's see if they're going to make it. But uh, I was very pleased they reached out to me also to help them to uh, to look for some of the leaders. Um, and they choose the Czech Republic because of the talent, more specifically cybersecurity, given a vast Navy G uh, and all the other startups. Uh, but the country was attractive for them, given the talent that is available. Hopefully we'll see uh, more soon. Yes, and I will add that... Uh 
you know, in the Czech Republic, it's a, co it's a country with 10 and a half million people, 70, over 70 universities. Like, this is crazy number. The level of education here is amazing. And these uh, universities release to the market hundreds of, of highly skilled graduates every year. This is a very good reason to come to this market. Still, it's very hard to hire here because uh, the demand is, uh, is, uh, is quite high. But uh, that's... Uh, to follow on what uh, Yuval and Ori said. Y Combinator advises founders to plan for the worst amid markets uh, tear down. Do you agree? I think you should always plan for the worst. Like, uh, that's a good advice always, but uh, yes, we're seeing slowdown. We see that uh, money, it's harder to get money from funds today. If in the past you could come with a slide and say, okay, I want money based, based on the ID, you can still do it. But if you're in, an, in a more advanced uh, stage, uh, people are starting to be harder. They want to see results. Uh, it doesn't have to be only in money number of clients, uh, depends what your metrics, but it's a bit harder. And uh, if you're planning to raise money in the next, uh, I would say, uh, 18 months, maybe doing it earlier than later. Well, I don't want to say that's my advice because I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball to the future, but that's my feeling. Yeah, look, I think the bull, the bull market's done for a while, right? Uh, you, you see it, like I'm no, I'm no microeconomic specialist, but you, you see where this is going, right? All the big private equities, all the big VCs are going to look, at their, the balloon has deflated, right? They're going to look for real profits, they're going to look for real products that have that are sustainable earnings, right? Um, I would I give a, an example that's very close to home. Uh, Muse raised a relatively large round uh, about a year before COVID hit us. You can imagine that COVID didn't do great for the travel industry. Uh, and in, in March 2020, we, uh, we took a big hit, right? And uh, we were just on the verge of going into hyper growth, which would kind of deplete our cash resources pretty quickly. We we're very fortunate that actually COVID happened and slapped, in some sense, slapped us into submission before we did that. So I would, my, my tip here, my kind of distilled tip here is for companies planning on raising money and going into growth phase, Cut your forecasts, raise more than you want, dilute a little bit more, even if it hurts, and, and just have reserves. Um, and don't, <laughs> from experience, it's a painful day that you find out that, you know, you have to let go of 200 people in, in, in a month because your industry shut down. Now, obviously, that was, uh, that was a kind of a black swan. Nobody expected travel disruption uh, in that scale, but it could happen in any other industry. And as you said, the, the kind of the, the money flow has slowed down, right? Uh, definitely. We, by the way, we made we gave the same advice to our uh, startups. Uh, we sent a letter to all our startups advising them. We gave them few steps on how to prepare for the slowdown that may be coming. Uh, before I go back to the question from the audience, I want uh, my last question. I don't, we, we're running out of time, so it's important for me to say what do you think we can learn from the what the Israeli startups can learn from the Czech startups. And I'll share a story. It's the work-life balance. So I came uh, here, as I said, in 2009 uh, with all the energy from the industry uh, in Israel, which you work almost 24 by 7, seven days a week. You reply to email over weekend. It's like, of course. And uh, I was in the office in Brno, and we were just uh, a day before releasing a big release of our product. Uh, it was um, 5 o'clock. I was at the uh, corridor. And I was seeing one of the guys just leaving. And I asked him, why are you leaving? I mean, we are releasing tomorrow. It's so critical. I mean, we must finish everything. So he told me, I must cut the grass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was freeze. I had no idea how to answer this. <laughs> this thing, I just let the guy go. And I was thinking to myself, who is right and who is wrong over here? And over time, I realized that during the weekend, people are putting on top of their car, either in the winter, the ski, or are they going to the chata, and uh, chalupa, and uh, also ask myself, who is right, who is wrong? And I'm responding to email, doing some work, and they are having fun, and 12 years forward, I learned that they are right, and they check are right. You always need to balance it, not to the extreme that you're not doing your work, of course, but let's not forget we are living and we need to enjoy life, definitely if you have kids. And this is something I learned from the Czech Republic to get the right balance. And it's not that I'm not achieving less results than I achieved before. I'm just enjoying my time much better. I see my friends and ex colleague in Israel still working that crazy time, and they really... You know, the kids growing up and they're missing, you know, the best time with the family. 
uh, and uh, just feel sorry for them. So thanks for the Czech, Czechs and the Czech Republic for giving me this uh, awesome Th thing. A thousand percent. As someone that probably is going to his Cholupa on Friday, I can I can vouch for that. And especially, the, and this is something that, again, I, I see so many Israeli uh, friends that literally don't see their kids. And yeah. I have, there, there's about four people in this room that can vouch that I'm rarely seen in the afternoon. Um, and I'm always off to take some kid to a ballet class or a basketball class or whatever. And again, that's something Israeli companies just don't have. Uh, this answering emails at midnight, it's, it's just, in retrospect, I used to do that all the time. I, admittedly, I still do it sometimes, but it's, it's just all wrong. I agree, I, can, I cannot agree more. You're doing it from your bed. I used to do it from the office still at midnight and I was so oh, yeah, crazy. Makes sense. <laughs> Maybe COVID make, make it better for people now that they work more remotely. If U.S. is unsuccessful for expansion, why don't Israeli startup go for Europe, specifically Czech Republic? Uh, would that even be a good idea? Well, I, I can yeah. answer personal experience on that. So when we, uh, at, we at my previous life at Excel, we had about 100% of our revenue from Europe, mainly because what we did was illegal in the U.S., but that it, be, <laughs> it, it became legal later on. Um, but I, I think the answer for most is that the U.S. is just a comfortable, it's a comfortable spot because you, you get 400 million yeah. people with one language that most speak in some capacity. Europe requires a lot more effort. Uh, every country is fundamentally different in its legislation and, and, and the, language, the languages you need. Not impossible, there are, but I would, as someone that actually went that path, uh, out of, went the path of going to Europe, I, I completely think, I completely agree with whoever, with Anonymous that wrote this, that it's usually overlooked by Israelis. Yes, but uh, it's easier once you manage to go to the US, it's easier, you have 300, uh, 330 million people, uh, pretty much homogenic, the same culture, it's, it's easier to go there. Here you have to deal with, it's fragmented. Uh, Plus from the fundraising for later stage, it's obviously easier if you've got a US footprint, I get it, but there are definitely are, will be, can be opportunities for Israeli companies here. And specifically the question about Czech Republic is the same answer we gave to Israel, it's too small. Uh, it's a small car. It's a but small market. But in the market. car industry, you do see Israeli startups coming over here because of all the um, car industry in the country, which is definitely very dominant and very attractive, given now with all the autonomous car and those kind of technologies. I'm really interested in cooperating with startups in Israel, especially in tech. Any do's or don'ts uh, when approaching, collaborating with them? Actually, with Israel, it's very, very easy. I think there's no do's and don'ts. Just be yourself, really. That's the best way to approach no need to wear a startup. Suit. No, just be yourself. And, and yeah, a lot of people call me. And me if punk. they shout at you, don't run away. They, <laughs> yeah. will, it's, it's not, they will take you to lunch at the end of the day. It's not personal. Yeah, Israel is very informal. A lot of people here call me Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Avidor, and I feel like very old. So I'm telling, please just call me Ravit. It just makes me feel so old. Mm -hmm. So just take off all your formalities. I think Israel is really appreciate authentic uh, authenticity. So be yourself. That would be the best advice I can Plus, give you. Plus, I would say there is some kind of preconception with Israelis about European being, European people as a whole. I know it's such a generalization, being this distant. So exactly, if just act yourself and be straightforward and you know easy. That's the best, the best way to our heart. That's a question for you, Ari. I would, love, it. I would love to know the answer to this one as well. You'll get the memo when it happens. <laughs> Who will buy Team Odeon and when? Is this uh, you, Anna? No. <laughs> you guys? No. There'll be a formal email when that happens. <laughs> I want to know before. Okay. Uh, who should, uh, why should a foreign startup not best their business in the Czech Republic? <laughs> For all the reasons we say why you should start in the Czech Republic, the foreign startup should start in their own market. So basically what we think the startups should start in their own market, it's just easier, it's easier to start in your own culture, in your own market, and then you expand to other, other markets. Don't be offended. If uh, a startup decide not to come to the Czech Republic but go to Germany or Poland or Romania, it's not personal, we're just small, and it's the same with Israel. So uh, we don't have revolut in Israel, we have the re revolut in the Czech Republic, but Israel is too small, so we don't take it personally. <laughs> I think uh, we have uh, four more minutes, if anyone from the audience wants to ask anything. You know, Czechs hardly ever ask questions, so I'm half Israeli by this. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think about social entrepreneurship? You know, well, because very women are more likely to start this pathway, not to go into tech, but to start in the area they are more inclined to. 
And again, I see that in Israel there are very many incentives, not only to look at the business side, but also to look at whatever supports the society and so on. I think it's very important, but uh, in a startup, I think it's uh, it's a luxury for a startup. So when I'm looking at a startup, it, it's nice. I'm happy to see that it's happening, but uh, I'm not expecting this necessarily to be there. Uh, it's not one of my factors when I decide to invest into a startup. I'm investing in very, very early stage. When we're talking about uh, companies in uh, in larger scale, like uh, social bakers and uh, and Muse, Yes, I do expect this. I think it's a must. I don't think it's a nice to have. I think it's a must, and I think corporates uh, corporates needs to do it, and they're actually doing it. You had it in Social Baker. Yeah, I'm sure you had yeah, it. Yeah, I always told my investors and shareholders that as we, I don't have a better word to say, consume the resources from the society, we also need to find a way to give back and help. Uh, we cannot just expect the country to give us the talent. We need to help the talent in the country or to help the people in the country. And we allocated resources to help, as I mentioned, the uh, young girls to be exposed to technology. We helped to, uh, some uh, families that were, uh, you know, unfortunate and, and their uh, life very difficult in the north of the country. We tried to do our best with the resources that we have, but the notion was we cannot just expect to consume, we also need to give back to what we can give back and what the shareholders, of course, agree to give back, but we should not forget about that part. So we did it in AVG, we did it in social bakers, and we also did it on a personal level. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. No, de definitely support that. Look, and, and back in the day at Excel, we were public, so we had to publish an, publish an ESG report, environmental, social, government. So obviously we, we were very, we had a budget for this. We were very clear. We, you know, we supported a group of, uh, I think it was Orthodox women that uh, just turned them into developer, into programmers. We had a, uh, my, a group of inner city kids that we gave them web design courses or whatever. Um, but I think what you're asking is more about impact investing uh, as part of the investment landscape, right? Um, I would argue, this is just my personal investment thesis, I'm a, I'm a big believer in impact for profit, right? I think uh, non-profitable uh, impact investment is just not a sustainable thing. And I know, for example, we talked about it a little while ago, that there is, there's starting to be the roots of first impact funds also here. Um, but honestly, that's, opt that's mainly up to the institutional investors and high net worths in this country to decide they want to invest in impact. Because um, if there's money dedicated to this, startups will come, right? Because uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, even if they think I can you know, do something that is extremely impactful for education, waste uh, management, or I don't know what, if they feel they're not going to be able to get money, they're not going to do it. But if they know that you know, a group of high net worths or a big group of institutional investors have bundled up and there's 500 million uh, euros up for grabs in Central Europe for impact, but that, that's more the financial community's responsibility, I think, and we should, we should push them to do it. Yeah. Uh, our time is up. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for asking questions. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for staying uh, until now. <laughs> so thank you very much, guys and girls. Thank you.